Um, that's Ron Irwin. This is his book. That's Farai Mudzingwa. This is his book. And by process of elimination, that's Marita van der Feyfer, and this is her book. Um, I don't have a book. I also don't have a can of wine on the table. At 8 o'clock last <coughs> night, when I started a session, there was a can of ice-cold Shiraz on the table. I didn't feel like it. I do feel like it now. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming. It's the... I just... Book festivals, are they not wonderful, wonderful things? I've done quite a few over the years, several hundred panels, and I don't think I've ever approached a panel with as much trepidation as I approached this morning's panel. Not because the three books are not individually wonderful, they are. Not because the three authors are not individually wonderful, well, I'm not so sure. No, they are. <laughs> it is because the theme is the importance of water in, in their books, and I'm not sure that water is the most important theme in some of these books, so I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to connect the conversation to that topic. But I'm sure we can move away from water to air, sea, sky. You know. um, Ron, Ron's book is, um, there, there is a, it's the story of uh, an American artist who has been living in South Africa for a couple of years, her investor husband came to South Africa to make some money. He is now convinced that South Africa is going down the tube, so he needs to move his investments out back to New York. Uh, she grew up in New York, started her artistic career in New York, but she feels at home in Cape Town. She, uh, she feels a little trapped in the marriage. She feels at home in Cape Town. She does not want to follow her husband's instructions that it's time to sell the house, which they have at Buck Woburn, and move back to New York and start another phase of their lives. And then she has, she goes swimming, as she does regularly, and <coughs> there is a surfer, unusually, in that part of the sea, and they have a joint encounter with a great white shark. And it is, it is a change of life moment for her and the surfer, Ben, who's 10 years younger than she is and who makes a living out of painting, yachts, and so on, and that shakes loose a whole new way of living for her. So the most critical element of the book happens in the sea, and where a lot of the action happens is in the bungalow on the rocks at Buckworthen. There is a drought in Cape Town, so the absence of water is also thematically and narratively important in the book, but there's a heck of a lot more going on, and, and also primarily her canvases at this time of her life are of the sea, so there's a, there's a lot of water in the book, but it's not, it's not the only thematic and narrative element that is important in the book. Farai's book um, is, is about a young man called Jerry, or Jedza, who starts out life in eastern rural Zimbabwe, miners drift, moves a little bit um, closer to a terrible township type slum, and then moves to the avenues in Harare. Um, at, a, at a time when Zimbabwe is undergoing the worst of the Mugabe era, the era of economic collapse and uh, elite extraction and so on. And water harbors spirits and water harbors the harm that has been done to Zimbabwe by the colonists, by Cecil John Rhodes's project and what happened afterwards, and now the harm that is being done by what is happening in Zimbabwe post kind of 2000, I suppose. So the water captures all of that, and there are these strange eruptions of water under the Musasa trees that line the avenues, the area in Harare where he stays. So water has a very important spiritual significance in Farai's book, but again, there are lots of other things that are important. And I'm sorry, Marita, but Marita's book is set by the seaside. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of it. Uh, <laughs> in, in the early pages, there is a sense of the sea taking away and the sea providing, but it's one of the opening scenes of the book. It, it is about a, a collection of old friends who haven't seen each other for a very long time. Um, they met mostly in Stellenbosch, 60s, 70s, early 80s, um, they remained friends despite the fact that some of them had um, adulterous affairs with other of them. Some have left the country, some have discovered um, a different kind of sexuality, and they converged on the seaside home for a meeting to celebrate a 70th birthday, one of the main characters, a painter. 
And in the early stages of the book, they are picking mussels off the rocks. Uh, so the sea giveth. And an important element in the story is the fact that one of the, the two central characters had a child taken by the sea when that child had boy, when that boy was very, very young. So the sea giveth and the sea taketh away, which is... But let me, let me start. Sorry, you're probably waiting for a question, aren't you? Um, I mean, could this book have been set on a farm in, outside of Franz Hook? Or is, this be, it, is it being at the sea and a significant element. I mean, when you were planning the story, planning the characters and the interactions, did you say, it's got to be by the sea? Yes, yes. Um, there was a, an earlier book, um, Breathing Space. It's not, this is not, I don't see it's a follow-up because you don't have to have read Breathing Space to, to read Still Breathing, but the, about a group of friends, may, let's call it the prequel, um, about a group of friends over 10 years in the 80s and 90s who spend weekends together and usually at the sea because as these things go, I think one weekend is spent on a farm somewhere. Um, so for me, when I finally got them together again, 25 years, the first time in 25 years that all of them get together again with their children and maybe one or two grandchildren even, I, for me it had to be at the sea. Um, uh, it, it's a part of the book and then there's Adrian that was, was one of the main characters, he's the painter and he also obsessively paints the sea where in his younger days he, he used to paint women, especially women he wanted to take to bed it was um, one of the characters um, ac accuses him of using his, his, his paintbrush as, an, as a substitute for his penis, if you can't fuck a woman, you paint her um, and vice versa. Uh, so he for, then there's also that thing that he is now 70 and he has this, almost the same obsession with the sea. He's painting, only paints the sea over and over, all the moods of the sea in the same way that in his younger days he might have wanted to paint the moods of a, of a beautiful woman. Okay. And, and Farai, one of, the, one of the many things that I loved about your book is the way it expresses Shona culture, Shona heritage, without, without talking down to me, the reader, who doesn't know much, who knows nothing about Shona history and Shona culture. You put it there. You put it on the page. You, uh, the characters live through it, live against it. And so in Shona culture, what, what role does, does water play, which then translated onto the pages of this book? Um, it's, it's, it's very significant. Um, it's, it's one of the, so we have these, uh, and you get them in, in, in so-called indigenous cultures, um, and we have what we call these, and the names get a bit tricky, uh, clan names, totems, um, and water is one of them, but water captures, so you've got people whose totems are specific animals, lions, cheetahs, but when it comes to water, you have different fishes, you've got hippos, but then there's, they're all under this umbrella of water, and they call it zeal. Um, and then there's a very interesting one in that, which captures the spirituality of water, which is the, what they call the njuzu, which can be a mermaid in certain cultures. So that is like an umbrella mystical force in the water. Because um, the, the, the first chapter of the book has people crossing a patch of water and a njuzu grabbing one of them and dragging her underwater and almost grabbing another who becomes then a significant character in the book. She's the sister of the central character, Matsai, and he actually <laughs> goes to Arari to find her because she has disappeared. And they are on her ankle, the marks of the njuzu, who tried to grab her and failed. And those marks remain on her ankle, and they are a physical and a metaphysical reminder of important elements. Yeah, yeah. And where you'll find reports of sightings or where these Njuzu are said to, to, to exist, it's usually these springs um, in, in inaccessible areas or these places where that retain water even in times of drought. So it's almost like we make them sacred so we protect them. 
Um, and maybe some of the myths have to do with, uh, to do with these um, abductions, have to do with trying to protect and finding ways to put a bit of fear into people, to not disrupt these water systems, block them, dam them, um, extract them, and you protect the spiritual entities in them. Because I mean, uh, the rivers that used to flow through Harare have been, have been dammed, and the colonial project changed the, the riverine infrastructure of Zimbabwe, so changed the spiritual richness of that country, which became known as Rhodesia, and then Zimbabwe. And, and this, is, this is nature. This is spiritual nature. This is um, actual nature in, this, in the sort of biodiversity sense, fighting back yeah. against civilization. Yeah, and that creates the conflict between, so the colonizing project sees water as a resource, as, as a capital resource. Harare itself is built on, on a wetland. Um, the government buildings are on a causeway. So you dam that, the main thoroughfare through Harare is, was a waterway, and they just dammed it, uh, sorry, uh, they built a, an embankment, cut it off, and the water actually is rising. It, it sounds like a fictional element in the film, but it, it is. You get these soggy parts um, of the foundations break across the city, but even the more widespread impact is there's a lot of underground streams under Harare that then come out in rivers, that then go down into the Zambezi. And all of those, because of what's happening in Harare, those are not flowing. Um, and then the farms downstream from that, because there's so little water flowing, there are a lot more dams. They're damming in, in their properties. And eventually there's a big dam further down, 30 k's out of, out of Harare. It's empty. It's been empty for the last 10, 15 years. And it all starts with the project of damming and building over. So there's that spiritual conflict between uh, civilization, uh, capitalism, technological progress, and retaining this life-giving source that for the people that live there, they don't see it as, as a, they see it as a resource that does not belong to anyone. Seasonally, it fertilizes, waters, and then sustains. It doesn't belong to anyone. So there's a conflict between this capitalism and this uh, communal resource that's given a spiritual life-giving. Um. Um, Ron, uh, water is obviously important to you as, as a writer. Ron's first book, 10 years ago, you've been lazy. I know. You've been lazy. First book, uh, 10 years ago, Flat Water Tuesday, was also, uh, water was very important, but it was what was happening on top of the water rather than what was happening in the water that was important. A book called Flat Water Tuesday, which looked at the very competitive um, um, rowing in, um, environment in American universities, and then this one set by, by the sea. So, I mean, how... Look, th there's so much water. There's, the, there's the, the saving of water, the wasting of water. There's the sea. There is the damage that the sea does to the house, which is kind of, you know, metaphorical in a, mm. in a very... Not obvious, but a very important way. Mm. So... That encounter and, and the, the eye of the shark, something that really plagues both Stella and Ben throughout, and it's one of the reasons why they fall into bed together, is to try and close the eye of the shark. So water for Ron Irwin on the novelist. So, and, and um, that, that house is in the back oven. Um, and I, I, for years, my wife, before she was my wife, she was my girlfriend, we'd go there like probably everyone in this room has, if you're a Cape Townian, um, then go to the rocks and have a glass of wine. And a friend of mine owned a house in Bakoven, and she was in publishing, and she would have me over. Publishing? A in house publishing. in Bakoven? Can you believe it? Not a writer. Her husband had money, not her. Oh, no. And, um, no, no. And, uh, and she, she had this place, and it was really a lovely bungalow, and I'd go there, and she'd make me coffee. And, and we, I went there on one day, and the water was literally coming off the rocks and spraying the windows as we were talking, to the point where you almost couldn't hear the other person. And I finally said, Rebecca, this is just marvelous. This is, I can't get over this house. It's so beautiful, and uh, I feel like I'm in a boat. I don't feel like I'm in a house. It's so close to the water. And she said, yes, but it's not as, as nice as you think, Ron, because if you look at this, and she took her finger, and she pressed it into the 
into the railing and it just went right through. All the wood was rotting and all the screws and bolts around this room we were in were falling out. And she said, this place is consistently falling apart and I, 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 I have, I'm trying to keep it together and I thought I need to put this into a novel. Um, this house, it's so beautiful and yet the structure of it is, is so compromised because the salt water is so close to it. And I had this image of a woman uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and this woman was standing at that house in front of her pool and she'd thrown <coughs> all of her furniture into the pool. And I thought, I think I'm going to write a book about why this woman in this rotting house threw all her furniture into the pool. And that became my side of the ocean. And I think that the closeness of it, when I describe this to people in the States, if you go to Bakoven, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful and we all know that area, but people don't believe it in the States, that you could, you could conceivably, very conceivably, uh, wake up and jump off your own little rock point and run into a great white shark. Now we know the great white sharks, the other side of the continent, I know that, but friends of mine have seen sharks there and the sharks are everywhere. And the fact that you could just do that and live like that is, is, is absolutely unique. And I've never seen anything close to it. Um, a, a, a place that's a little hidden cove right next to a big city. Um, and so that's where the, the idea of my side of the ocean came about. And then... And, and the shark, I mean, is the shark just a shark? So the shark is more than a shark. The shark is, everyone always said, I, I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, there were no sharks. There was a lake, no sharks. And I come here and I wanted to go paddle skiing and I um, bought a paddle ski. And I bought it from this guy and he said he'd give me lessons on the paddle ski. And I thought, this is great, macho. I said, oh, by the way, any sharks out there? And he said, yes, there's heaps of sharks out there. This is Cape Town. So I said, have you ever seen one? And he said, yes, I've seen the sharks out there. And he told me the story about going out with a beginner, which would be me, except this is another beginner. And they were paddling around, and he suddenly saw the fin come up, and it was a big shark. And he thought, if I tell the beginner that there's a shark here, he's going to be very afraid and flip over and get eaten. So he said, just lean into me, and we'll paddle in on the next wave, and I'll show you how to catch a wave. And as he caught the wave, it worked beautifully, and he turned to his right, and there was the shark's eye right in the wave looking at him. And he described it to me in such detail that I immediately gave back that paddle ski and never went paddle skiing once, ever. <laughs> but I thought that too will go into a novel. Um, and I, 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 I vividly remember sitting around the table and him telling me the story. And I thought, well, this is a sport. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm very against doing sports where you could get eaten. And so stop that. But I did put it into the novel. And, the, and then I read, people will say, sharks aren't just man-eaters. There's more to sharks than being a man-eater. We don't understand sharks. And I used to think that's it's not true. They're man-eaters. I mean, I can't get beyond that. But then I started to research, and I started to look into sharks, and they're part of the ecosystem. We have, there's 440 species of shark in the world. We have over a quarter of them in, 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 the, in South Africa, in the South African waters. Uh, we have all the, all the good sharks, all the cool sharks are down here. I started to read a lot more and, and started to think, not only are they part of an ecosystem, but clearly they represent something to... Um, to human beings, something very deep and, and meaningful. So it starts out as a, well, an attack, you might say, and then it turns into an evolving relationship with the shark and what it represents and what it, what it is and, and how surfers and how, because the, the, the love interest is a surfer and how, and I spoke to a lot of surfers about this, how they get this in their mind and how they live with the sharks and how this is really part of the system down here. And, it, and by the end of the, of the novel, and the novel's not just about her relationship with sharks, although she's an artist and she begins to draw them and, and paint them and, and, and they become part of her imagination. Um, and it becomes her evolving, her, her, her coming to grips with sharks and with the sea and with uh, everything they might represent, which is death, yes, but also change, also life, um, also moving along and taking risks in life um, when you might not otherwise be uh, rewarded by doing so. And 
five, five of the pages in this book are worth the purchase price alone, <laughs> and they have nothing to do with water. They have to do with rats, and I mentioned this to Ron. He said, well, rats drown in water sometimes, so you can, can raise it. It's an exchange of emails between the academic staff at UCT, and Stella, in, in addition to being a practical painter, is also somebody who lectures at, at UCT. And uh, the, uh, the first email comes from Mandy, the Fine Arts Secretary, who says, Dear all, it's come to my attention that there is a dead rat in Lecture Hall A01. Our ultra-care service providers have been made aware of the problem and will endeavour to remove it as soon as possible. Apologies for the convenience. To which Professor Johann Simpson replies, Surely we must call for the evacuation of the building. This is a clear health hazard, Mandy. Is UltraCare going to fumigate the learning venue? Do we know how long the rat has been dead for? I have a class in there in 15 minutes, postmodern bodies and modern aesthetic, the corporeal and the unreal. Where shall I direct my students? Is the venue closed for the rest of the week? Surely it is. And then Professor Tandi Semanyani says, Mandy, Johan, colleagues, this does not seem right at all. I have a personal horror of rats, and to this end agree with Johan. The venue should be treated before we allow students in it. We have a pastoral responsibility regarding the health of these students. What does it say about the efficacy of our efforts towards campus hygiene? I cannot allow my students to use this venue again in good conscience until it has been properly fumigated and aired out. And then there's five pages of these utterly ludicrous emails. But you say, Ron... They're not this ludicrous. Was, this was it not happened. an act of the imagination. I, I saved those. I was teach, I've was i taught at UCT <laughs> for 25 years, and I, I was teaching in the Commerce Department, and it's a long story how I got there. And this email chain started to appear on my screen, and I thought, this is going to go into a novel because it's too <laughs> ridiculous and unbelievable. And then I would share it, and I just watched page after page of email about one dead rat. At UCT, and I thought, it's, they're not escaping this, and now that I have tenure, it's published, because they can't get rid of me. Um, I, I found an academic paper, PhD paper, online, uh, Water Symbolism in Literature, and water as symbolism in literature is used as a repetitive theme, represents a multitude of concepts, especially symbolizes the concepts of life, purification, and transformation. Water's fluid nature and ability to flow and adapt makes it a symbol of change and renewal. Uh, water symbolizes creation and the divine, serving as a metaphor for spiritual rebirth. Additionally, water can be used as a reflection for displaying the depths of human emotions like calmness, serenity, instability, and chaos, also associated with cleansing and purification. Rituals uh, in dreams, it symbolizes emotions. Dreaming of muddy water represents struggles in life and negativity. Um, in uh, universally purity, life, motion, renewal, transformation, the driving force behind every human civilization, chaos in the form of the primary ocean, Teo's tradition, water representing wisdom because of its resistant nature, and then a whole series of, of literary extracts which show the different symbolic elements of water, a poem by Ralph Waldo Emerson, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Chael Gibran, Karen Hess, Margaret Atwood, and so on. Um, so, Marita, of all of those things that water can represent, what are the things that water represents that are important to you as, as an individual, as a writer, just in the act of conceiving, the act of writing, and then what you put into your books? Because you've written about 193, I think. Oh, such <laughs> exaggeration. Um, I don't know, somehow there's always water, but in my case, usually the sea, in most of my books. I mean, I was just as surprised as you to be on this panel about water, and because um, I don't write about dams or about drought so much, but then I realize it probably has to do with the sea. Um, and the sea is a specific kind of water that comes and goes, and it's that flux and coming and going. Um, for me, one of the, I, I use um, other writers' um, quotes and so on from, from, from writers that have inspired me. Um, and in this, in this specific in breathing space, I use um, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway as a kind of a, just a, a reference. But um, I'm thinking of another book, To the Lighthouse, um, and the, the, the flux, the, the flowing. So this is a, this is a story wh which is told from... 20 different perspectives. I didn't want to choose a main character. Uh, 
Um, uh, um, so I decided to tell it from 20 people, ages. And that's also that thing, so it comes and goes. There isn't a one solid um, narrator telling you the story. Um, and there's lots of walks at the sea, and they, they swim in the sea, and they watch sunsets on the sea, and they, they quote Proust, who said, I have a horror of sunsets, they're so operatic. So <laughs> for me, and all those things, um, I think it's m more than anything else, it's that, it's that flux, it's the everlasting. The lives are so small. Um, these people are acutely aware of their own mortality, especially the older generation, um, and how quick it all goes. But the sea is always there. The sea goes on and on and on and always moves. That will make sense to you, I'm sure, Ron. Yes, w without a doubt. It's, uh, it, 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 and was she, by painting the sea, um, I actually worked with a painter and uh, she showed me how to paint a seascape, which was fascinating. And I think it, 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 be it becomes a breakthrough moment for her as an artist. Uh, I don't paint. I write, obviously, or I wouldn't be here. Um, but I did find that the, the symbolism of that and being able to represent that and get it onto paper and find that color and the many colors that the sea represents was, was crucial for her and um, it was my entryway into who the artist was. Uh, you don't have the sea, Farai. Um, Farai told us earlier that he's not sure where he lives, but he lives between Johannesburg and Harare, and neither in Johannesburg nor Harare do you have the sea. Um, uh, Ron mentioned the genesis of this book, the two sort of things that had to go into a novel, and out of that the novel was formed. Um, we, Marita told us about the previous book, the characters, and wanting to show them to us 25 years on. I mean, I'm always fascinated how stories start, a story which arrives in such perfectly shaped form in a book like this. And what a beautiful book, a hardcover, a debut novel, published first Lucky as a him. hardcover. <laughs> well done. It doesn't seem as amazing to other people as it does to me, but there we go. So, I mean, you, you, you don't feel shortchanged by not having the sea and all these metaphorical, mystical elements of the sea. It's, it's, it's never been a factor for me. Funny enough, I've, I've lived in Durban, I've lived here in Cape Town, I lived in Strand for about three years. Uh, so I get the fascination, um, I understand it, <laughs> but when I went back inland, I was just like, eh, that was nice. <laughs> and what you mentioned about the, yeah, this thing in its genesis was a lot of different things. Um, so a lot of the work in the final editing process, which is last, what year are we in? Last year about eight, nine months of last year, was make, turning these different short stories, non-fiction pieces, wannabe essays into one cohesive narrative. And yeah, that, that was tough. And the, I think the method that I used in retrospect was to have the, prot the protagonist, because it's actually two siblings, three, if you include the avenues as a place and protagonist, to have those two siblings have their ancestors be this water entity. And so the friction between that water entity, uh, spiritual element of water resisting colonization plays out in the individual lives of these two siblings three, four generations down. Um, that is the element I used to bring all of that together. How it happened, I have very little idea, but my editor and I somehow came around to it and, and it worked. Can I, can I yeah. add something there? I wonder if it doesn't also go back to roots in a, in a, in a way, because um, you didn't grow up at the sea. Um, you maybe feel more at home and in another uh, environment, whereas for me the sea is my surname, van der Pfeiffer, it means, it's a Dutch thing, it means Pfeiffer is a kind of a, a fish, uh, place where you, where you catch fish among the rocks. And I have um, a, a Zeeman, Zeeman forefather, and I have a Scottish sailor, 
Um, so I don't know, I feel as if the sea is in my blood from, <coughs> from paternal and maternal side, and I was born in Cape Town and I grew up. Uh, um, so for me, it's almost unimaginable living far away from the sea. So it's just a, a root thing, it comes from the guts. Possibly, yeah, because I, I would be disoriented by the ocean. Like my first sighting of the ocean, I was just like, this thing just <laughs> is endless, it's boundless, it just bends over the horizon. My four-year-old son, the first it. time he saw the sea was at Musenberg, he's four years old, and he said, Daddy, Daddy, a big bath, Daddy, a big bath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm totally, for me, uh, that, that's probably what it is. For me, it's just this foreign element thing that is cool to jump into and observe when I'm there, and when I'm not there, it's just never in my mind. <laughs> And I, and I, do, I do think that one of, the, one, of the, one of the aspects of your book that does cause a read, well, it caused this reader to, to stop and reflect, is that whole issue. Because, I mean, there's a, there's a huge academic debate about damming rivers. And um, because during the drought and now, um, as we are heading into summer and it looks as if next year might be a much drier year than this year, I'm getting listeners contacting me and saying, why aren't we damming more rivers? Hey, because damming rivers is really bad for a whole lot of stuff. It's not very good for capturing water and it does an enormous amount of ecological damage. So that theme is in the book, but then there's added to that theme the fact that if you're disrupting the natural flow of things, you're disrupting the spirits that are part of that natural flow. You're disrupting the metaphysical as well as the material. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think I, I mentioned it just earlier. The, so the first project is planting the Union Jack in what was then Salisbury, um, damming it up, uh, cutting off the water, drying it up, building on it. And there's a section in the book where I bring that like 50 years, yeah, about 50, 60 years later from 1896 to the 1950s. And the essence of it is, so they decide, the colonial administrators, they decide, ooh, that was successful what we did in Harare. Let's go big on it. And they dam the Zambezi, Valley, and researching, it was actually, it's, it's quite interesting. It was this big technological marvel that Italian engineers who had just built, I don't know, I think it was the Hoover Dam or something, I don't know. It, it was a big thing and they were selling timeshares and you have a lakeside home, all of this. What they don't say is 55,000 people lost their homes and it was never reported how many died. There's, it's just like no one, because what it's, I don't know if how easy it I is. I mean, the, 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 doc, the documentary is about how the animals were rescued That's from the I small mean. islands. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And they talk about Operation Noah that saved, I think, a thousand animals. They don't say how many they did not save. Um, if you can imagine, this valley is wide. It's like 30 kilometers. It's, it's a massive, it's like a huge amphitheater with a number of, um, not hills, yeah, I suppose hills, um, or high-lying areas. So when this thing starts flooding, it's not like the animals just and people just go off to the sides. They go into highland, but you go into highland on an island that's lower than the eventual valley that's going to flood, you're going to drown. So there's a whole bunch of people and animals drowning on these little islands, and that's Kariba. Um, and now with the cracks in Kariba and the worries that the dam wall might hold, there are a lot of people who say, if you anger the spirits, this is the way they pay you back, and they genuinely believe that. And it did twice. It, 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 it what do you call it? It, it had uncharacteristic, out-of-season flooding twice while they were building the dam. And it washed it away, killed a whole bunch of people. Um, and the locals, the Batonga who live there, that's where they came up with, oh, this is Nyami Nyami, the river god, who's, who's been angered by this. He's trying to get to he or she, depending on <laughs> who you hear the story from, has been cut off from his or her partner on the other side. Um, my understanding of that is, it's not that there's a river, and, and is, uh, Nyami Nyami is in the form of a snake, giant snake. I don't, from what I understand, it's not that there's a big snake in the river, but the river itself, when you observe it from a vantage point, it's a long snaking 
Slaking River, that's been cut off. And that's what they refer to. Um, whether you believe there's a spirit in there or, but the essence of it is there's a life source that's been cut off for, we don't know why. We've lived like this for hundreds of years and then you just come and you cut it off, flood it, and these people just got shoved either to Zambia or Zimbabwe. No one cared where they were from, the families were split, and well, we've got electricity, so who cares? Yeah. Um, it, just, it, it has nothing to do with water, um, but one of the many fascinating uh, aspects of Farai's novel, I mean, Marita talked about having these 20 viewpoints, and, and you wonderfully, from one paragraph to the next, will go from third-person narration to first-person narration when the same person is involved. So there's an objective observer and then the self-narrator, and they, it's the same thing, it's the same action they're describing. There's all sorts of stuff like that which just absolutely works beautifully well. But then you do something that I've not seen before. I mean, I haven't read all of the novels that have ever been published, but of the many novels that I have read, I've never seen in a novel footnotes. Have you ever seen footnotes in a novel? No, there we go. So very quickly, the, why, why you have the footnotes. Because they are they're cheeky and they're wise and they are satirical and they are angry about what has happened to Zimbabwe, not just since Robert Mugabe went completely rogue, but uh, for the 100 years plus before that. Yeah, so there's a thing that happens in literature in my part of the world we are either writing, we're not, we're talking about this just before the panel started, we're talking about being on the margins of literature, mainstream, however you define that. And there's a period just before I started writing and when I started writing where our literature, the literature that was bought by agents and publishers was literature to do with how much Mugabe has messed up the country, confirm your suffering, uh, confirm things are bad, etc, etc which, you know, those are facts. There's nothing wrong with that. But it, it almost bottles you in. You can't write about anything else. So I wanted to write about what I wanted to write about that's going on. I did not want to focus on what Mugabe did, what farms he took, whether there's electricity or not. At the same time, you can't write about Zimbabwe without writing about that. Um, if you're going to write a scene where some character walks into town, he walks past a bank, there are people queuing, you have to explain why people are queuing at a bank two blocks down. If a car is weaving, snaking down a road, you have to explain why it's snaking down a road in the city center, why are there photos in the road, that kind of thing. I did not want to foreground that failure of the state, the state of the infrastructure. That's what the footnotes uh, were there for. So that you, you get them out of the way. Yeah, 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 19 this, this happened, Mugabe did this, white farmers did this, no, 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 cool. Now, there's this happening during the story. And I left it deliberately ambiguous. Who is actually the voice of the footnotes? Is it me? Is it the protagonist who's now wise? And in retrospect, having told the story, is now narrating what was actually going on while he was a kid. Is it him in retrospect? Is it me being cheeky? Stay tuned to find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I thought we'd, I'd, I'd ask um, the each to read from their books. Ron disgracefully didn't bring a copy of his own book, so he has mine. And if you wouldn't mind starting, and it's a scene where Ben is trying to explain to Stella why the incident with the shark was so important for both of them and why they both needed to conquer the fear and uncertainty that that incident brought to them, that they need to together conquer that fear. And he describes an experience of his of trying to surf it at dungeons, which some of you will know about, but it's one of the, one of the greatest, <coughs> if not the greatest, big, 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 wave surfing spot on the planet. Thank you. I, I, um, I worked with Men's Health Magazine. Uh, I was writing an art article with them, and the, the, they wanted to show how big these waves are. And the way that it's hard to look at a surfer 
and figure out how big he is compared to the waves. So they took the surfer and put them on the third floor of the building in his surf gear and took a picture of him. And that allows you to think how big these waves are out there. So this is Ben speaking to Stella. <clears throat> He's survived this situation. I figured this is it. I'm dead. There's no cool way out of this wave. I could keep riding this bloody thing, but when it finally came down, I'd be like an ant in a washing machine, you know? So I just let it rip and kept riding, and there was no shallow spot out there, right? It's not like the waves get smaller. You just ride along, and when you get off the crest, all you can see in front of you is another wall of water. And I rode this thing, and I was up for 10 seconds, longer. I have no idea, maybe 20 seconds, maybe more. And I was crouching on this wave and falling down the front of it, and the board was making this sound like taka 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 taka. And I pulled it out of the wave, and it rolled over me, and I just let it go. I was underwater for a long time, and I just kept pushing up, and the back channel kept pushing me away, and the wave took forever to pass. But when I got up to the surface again, I was almost dead, and I held on to the board and just floated there, and I knew I needed to kick out of that line if I could, but I got pulled up the face of another wave that didn't want to break. I was all along alone out there with the birds and stuff, and I'd been dragged close enough to the shore that I figured if I can survive this, if I can just ride this out, I can make it to the put-in place, get the board out of the water, and make my way back up to the path. But it took a long time, like forever. I swam and kicked, and it was getting dark, and that heavy mist was hanging over the water. And then it basically was dark, and I knew what direction to go, but I was tired. I just put my face down and pushed the board, kicked, swam, told myself I could make it. But what kept me going was thinking that if I just gave up and drowned, nobody would ever know I rode dungeons by myself. So I just kept kicking and being dunked and rolled until I could hear the break. And then I kept paddling and I could walk out with the board. And I just sat there in the sand and looked out at the ocean and it was nightfall, but you could see it sort of brooding out there. It felt like I sat there for hours, and then I just chucked the board into the bushes and walked back up to the car and slept there, woke up when the sun rose. Uh, for somebody who doesn't do water sports or do any sports where you could get eaten, the description of that ride in Dungeons is, is quite incredible. We haven't talked about, I'm amazed that we've got to quarter to 11 with no trouble at all, in a way. But the, the, the issue of the drought and the Newlands Water Spring and the class distinctions that that reveals as people wait. So there's a whole lot, actually a lot more about water that's important in your book than I originally thought. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Marita? Yes, well, um, I was suddenly thinking um, I could read a short passage that's the way water is used as a metaphor, seeing as we continue with water. <laughs> Um, it's, the two, it's two people, Miller and Rolf, and they've been friends for like 50 years, and somewhere along the way they also slept together. Um, uh, and now they've both, in the past few years, lost their partners. Um, so they are sitting at the seaside on the rocks, looking at the sea and having a, a, a short a discussion. I'll just read one paragraph. Um, how do you grieve? How did you grieve, Rolf? Mila asks at last. I'm looking for advice because you've been walking this road for longer than I have. It isn't really a road, more like a stream where you end up by accident, something that carries you along. There's no point in fighting it. There's nothing you can do except to keep your head above water. That was how the first year after Leslie's death fell to me as if I was adrift in a stream of sorrow. He passes his hand over his face. Sorry if that sounds too operatic. Oh, stream of sorrow, oh, river of woe. No, I know exactly what you mean. She takes another sip of wine. But then one day you realize the current isn't quite as strong anymore, right? That now and then you can feel the ground beneath your feet. That you can slowly start swimming in the hope that Someday you'll reach the tranquil shore on the other side. He nods slowly, repeatedly. It takes time. You have to be patient. The fuck up is that at our age, we don't have an awful lot of time left. But I tell myself, if Rolf can do it, so can I. 
So one of the many delightful things about Marita's book is that how, how do you deal with the past in the present? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it sounds trite, but in a skilled novelist's hands, it's anything but trite. We can't stop the past bleeding into our present and affecting our future. And how do we, particularly when we get to the point where the end of our mortality seems relatively close, how do we deal with that stuff? How do we deal with the people we've loved? How do we deal with the people we've hurt? Farai? So I always mention my editor when I'm talking about my book. Uh, the first chapter, final submission, was 7,500 words. And she clipped it down to 600. <laughs> <laughs> After you had to surrender 6,900 words. I'm still not sure how I feel right now. <laughs> Let me just breathe through it. But it's still captured, it's 600 words, just that. And it captures what I wrote in 7,500 words. So, yeah. So this is set in 1974. And I'm going to try these two contrasting um, narrations. Listen when the ancestors bite your ears. Natsai and her friends raced across the footbridge on their way from the early morning Roman Catholic church mass and teased whoever came last. Whoever is left behind is left behind. The same voice blurts out again. On your marks, seti, seti, go. Teresa was the slowest kid. She wheezed all the way down the footpath. Their little heads disappeared into the reeds along the stream, and only their shrieks and squeals sounded until they popped up on the home side. On this April school holiday Sunday, on which they stopped by the shops on their way back from church and each bought a loaf of white bread for morning tea, six kids emerged panting and giggling on the other side of the stream. Teresa did not. She dances, come see. In a watery den, she dances. As the kids reported the incident to their parents, Natai rubbed her ankle where the Njuzu had grasped at her before she had slipped through and it had reached for Teresa instead. A watery, viscous hand slides up out of the water and webbed fingers run up her foot. The prehensile grip around her ankle tightens. Fingers so cold they register as a burning sensation, a jolt, an electric shock of feeling shoots up her leg. The elder sighed and word spread from mouth to ear around Miner's Drift that another one had been taken. After this taking, as with the others before it, parents forbade their children from walking across the wetland or wandering near the stream and the deep pool near the narrow footbridge. <coughs> Take the longer route over the vehicle bridge, they cautioned. That family, those ones, they don't play properly. That's why these things happen to them, said others. Teresa's family gathered and performed a bira renjuzu at the pool to appease the water being. During the bira, the spirit of the taken child whispered from the watery depths, and through vigorous dance, the family elders learned what they needed to sacrifice before the njuzu would release the child. It took the better part of a week to source a goat, and in more costly fashion, the requisite mature black bull. She is of Vadzira, they chanted in unison to the water entity. We are kin, they pled while clapping in somber rhythm. Not a single tear was shed, for shedding tears would seal her fate. And so it was that after days of carrying out these and other rituals, she was returned to the surface unharmed, poised for life as a healer. As the gathered petitioners wipe the water from their eyes and wring out their garments, they catch sight of a little girl crawling up on the bank on her hands and knees. She has emerged at the edge of the pool, water streaming and dripping from her her thin dress clinging to her drenched body. The child is gasping as she tries to adjust to breathing the thin air above the surface. Teresa's mother rushes to embrace her. The faraway gaze in her child's unblinking eyes does not alter. Back home, Natai sat rubbing her ankle. My, they are saying that if it touches you, then you are now a bad person. Those are witchcraft things, my child. Let them touch each other, each other there where they do those things at night. Asimai, ah, you, Natai. What is it with you today? Natsai started to raise her foot up to show her mother the mark on her ankle. The thing, it was crying. I think it was trying to say something. Do not talk about those heathen things in this house. Do you hear me, Natsai? 
We pray in this house. People will believe in those Njuzu things, do the works of darkness. If you are not the person, you would bring me my rosary so we can pray right now. I am I'm biting your ears, and if you were another person, the phrases which mm. reoccur in, in the book, they're just lovely, lovely phrases. Um, I haven't left, well, I have left 10 minutes for questions, so um, bring the lights up a little bit, please, in the audience, so I can see if a hand goes up with a question. Ah, it was, we were entirely complete. We did not leave, ah. Thank you. Uh, Farai, I'm completely fascinated. I do lo love hardcovers, and I know how uh, seldom one gets them as a debut writer. So could you perhaps tell us your publication journey? Because, and, and hold up the book, because it's really beautiful. <laughs> it's just gorgeous, yeah. So could you tell us your publication journey? Um, sure. Firstly, I, I had no idea that debut authors don't get hard covers. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, cool, I guess. Um, the publication journey, well, it's, <laughs> I submitted to Cassava six, 2016, seven years ago. It's a Zimbabwe-based publisher. No, no, um, yeah. they're Nigerian, but oh. they also, they're Nigerian and they have an office in the UK. Okay. So this will be duly published, released in Nigeria and the UK. And it was a shit my news, it was, it was horrible. Um, rightfully, they very quick response, no thanks, we don't think, it was diplomatic, but it was basically no thanks. And then I rewrote and wrote again, and I got a South African publisher, Black Letter Media, about two years later, worked with them for a year, completed a manuscript, I was not happy with it, canceled that contract, rewrote it again for another two, three years. It, it, it's just been, it was five, six years of just writing, rewriting, it's been edited by a whole bunch of people. And finally I resubmitted to Cassava. My intention was always to resubmit to them, I wanted them. Um, there's a thing that I have about, I wanted an African publisher, but with an international foothold because the, the discussions I was having with international publishers, agents, they were just not getting what I was going for. Um, so five years submitted, I got a contact, another writer who happened to be in, putting a good word for me with Kasava, and I'll give him another chance, he has worked on it. And they did, and they loved it the second time around. So, yeah. <laughs> and then we worked on it for another year. <laughs> uh, anything else? Yeah, there we go. Just to say to Ron Irwin, your Blackwater Tuesday was one of my all-time favorite books, so I'm really looking forward to this next one. Thank you very much. It's nowhere near as good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe a question for Marisa. I'm curious to know if, um, how you feel about your characters. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they're Afrikaans, and if, you, if they get translated, how they, yeah, it's very attractive. Thanks for the question. Yes, I wrote it in Afrikaans, last Afrikaans. Um, although that book was also, the first Werkumkans was also translated as Breathing Space um, by Isabel Dixon, who was also here um, many years ago. Um, uh, so you always lose something in a translation, but if you're lucky and if you have a good translator, you also gain. Um, so what I think might have got lost a little bit was in the Afrikaans, um, maybe the distinction between the way the young people talk, the younger generation, the, the, the generation Z, um, or the millennials talk, and the older generation is more, um, might be more... Um, uh, distinct. Distinct, I think so. Uh, well, of course... A word for distinct. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You could see it. <laughs> you can immediately remark um, more. Uh, of course, I try to give each character its per per um, personality its own voice, his or her own voice. So it, they don't talk the same way, they don't think the same way. But I think in the Afrikaans, because younger Afrikaans people usually use much more slang um, 
uh, and it stands out. Of course, the, the, the younger generation, and especially the teenager Ben, I also have a Ben in the, in, in the book, um, uh, his, um, his talk is filled with, um, with internet, um, uh, text kind of slang, um, which stands out more in the Afrikaans, because it's another language. It's English used in Afrikaans, whereas in the English, it flows into the English. Uh, it's just a mo more modern kind of English. I once had a conversation who was bemoaning the fact that more and more English words were being used in Afrikaans, and she said, Ek haat anglicismus. Ek neem vreselijk exceptie dat hier. Okay. No, nowadays we have. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Melissa, another writer. <laughs> Got a question um, for Ron. Um, that beautiful scene you wrote about dungeons, what kind of uh, research did you need to do to write that? As someone who's not, if you, I assume you're not a surfer because you didn't take up your paddle ski any further. Did you need to go there? Did you speak to surfers? What did you need to do? Melissa's a, a prize-winning, award-winning, competition-winning stand-up paddle boarder. Oh, so be, well then be now careful. I'm scared. Um, <laughs> actually, I wrote an article when they did the competition down there. They haven't done it for a while, but the, the guy who won, I, I interviewed him for a website, which is probably defunct now, called Soul Gear, of all things. And so I met him, and, and um, we spent oh, at least uh, probably two, three hours, and he described it in great detail, to such detail that I actually didn't want so much detail. But I never forgot the interview, and, and, and I remember thinking, you know, my first question to him was, this is death defying. Dungeons isn't just big waves. It's cold waves and it's lots of kelp and sharks and thick waves. And th he described this to me. You, they're so thick that it's very easy to get crushed by them. So it's dangerous as well as dark and cold. And so winning dungeons, winning the, the big wave competition, which at that point was huge, uh, or still is huge if, you, if they can get the waves big enough, um, was a big deal. And he, he described it in such detail that I was able to take that description, that that interview I did, and then and, and hook it up with some research that I did, um, and because the actual descript the actual scene is longer um, than this, and um, I, I thought I I did a fairly credible job of it. You did an extremely credible job. I mean, I've surfed dungeons lots of times. I have. Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> If it's bigger than one and a half foot, I run away. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, we've reached the end. Thank you very, very, very much for coming. I think all three will be at a stall where your book is being sold. And so if there are further questions you would like to ask them and get them to sign the books, uh, they are three very, very different books. But they are three books which each in their own way give an enormous amount of pleasure to the reader. So please consider buying them and having them signed. And if you have any gaps in the next two days, please fill them with tickets to events at The Book Show. What's it called? Open Book. <laughs> the Book Show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Whoa, whoa, whoa.